The telephone. How could we live without it? I think it's abominable. I think it's costly. And I think it's a thundering nuisance. Incredibly, there was a time when phones weren't pocket-sized wireless devices, but bulky objects wired into our homes and workplaces. Historians call this distant era the age of the landline. Over the course of a hundred years, engineers rolled out a communications network that joined up Britain. A web of more than 70 million miles of wire one of the most ambitious engineering projects in British history. Yet telephones were initially regarded with suspicion. Who is going to answer the telephone? Will there be improper conversations between the maids and gentlemen callers? They were agents of social change. They were looking for educated, well-spoken young ladies who would be able to enunciate clearly. Number, please. Thank you. But when you wanted a phone, you often couldn't get one. It's a, sorry, you know, bad luck, John. In two years' time, um, you might get a telephone. This is the story of the battle to build Britain's phone network. The heroes. He said, tradesman to the rear. I said, does the doctor go to the rear? He said, no. I said, I'm a doctor of telephones. And heroines. It was really comical trying to have a tin hat on with these things stuck to your ear. The disappointments. He would shout down the phone in the hope that they would and put the phone down so the, the line would be restored and you could actually use it yourself. And dreams. Well, don't you think it would be rather fun? Don't you think anybody who goes up 500 feet would like a panoramic view of the greatest capital in the world just spread out in front of them? And why it is that now, when we're more connected than ever, it's not the telephone that's keeping us on the landline. In 1877, inventor Alexander Graham Bell sailed by steamship from America to Britain, the land he once called home. He'd come to showcase a revolutionary new electric device that was taking the US by storm, the telephone. At Osborne House on the Isle of Wight, Bell faced his sternest test yet. The stakes were high as he awaited the audience for his latest demonstration he had to impress none other than Queen Victoria. This no doubt entirely historically accurate film from the 1930s sets out Bell's meeting with the Queen, who politely makes no mention of the Scottish inventor's strangely American accent. I think you had better speak into it. After all, one does not converse with a wire. Beatrice. Major Phipps, come closer. Listen. If, if you please, ma'am, we're ready to begin. You may proceed. Sir Thomas Bidoff? Yes, I'm here. That is Sir Thomas's voice. Bell's telephone arrived at exactly the right moment. The rise of the office, a new phenomenon in Victorian society, had created an eager market of businessmen. There are legal changes to the notion of company, and the modern corporation is born at that time legally. And with it is somewhere for it to live, an office block, in America a skyscraper. So you suddenly you need to be able to talk to each other. Queen Victoria was amused enough to buy two devices from Bell, and the telephone was away. Flush with royal approval, Bell and his partners set up a firm, imaginatively named The Telephone Company. The fledgling service provided the most basic of systems. The first subscribers could only make calls to the other end of their own phone lines. Telephone communications were private circuits, um, point to point, which 
is to say they connected floors in a big house or, or, or in a factory. There was no network, no public network as such, no telephone exchanges. They were sold as private instruments, uh, initially by Alexander Graham Bell's agent, uh, Colonel Reynolds, who came across the Atlantic on a steamship with a bag full of these telephone instruments, which he sold to the very wealthy and, and to businessmen. As the potential for telephones in Britain became clear, Bell's company was joined by myriad competitors in a technological wild west. But businesses wanted to talk directly to their suppliers and customers. So the phone companies began to create networks of telephone lines connected by exchange switchboards. Early phones didn't have dials, so calls were put through by an operator. Hello, what do you want? The operator would physically have to take a plug, an electrical plug, and plug your wires into a socket, which was then the two wires connecting to the person that you wanted to speak to. Networks began to spring up in commercial centres across the country, a tangled web of cutting-edge engineering and financial opportunism. But progress wasn't pretty. So if you looked up in the sky, you would actually see this cobweb of wires crisscrossing the streets. The height, the danger of actually putting men up there to put the cables in. The risk when it snowed, with snow falling and on those wires creating a lot of weight, would sometimes bring telegraph poles and some of the derricks would actually collapse. The sprawling mass of wires expanded as fast as the companies could put them in. The network was changing the face of our cities. But what started out as a service for businesses soon began to stray into other areas of Victorian life, where it wasn't anywhere near as welcome. In Victorian society, the home was sacrosanct. Here, telephones were treated with outright suspicion. A whiff of scandal clung to the wires. Who is going to answer the telephone? Will there be improper conversations between the maids and gentlemen callers? Obviously, it was also lunacy, you know, fake news lunacy, i.e. Will I catch a cold if I answer the telephone and other people, person at the other end has a cold? There was that was going on. But there was a very real sense that this was a leveller, a social leveller, and that that was really not necessarily a terribly good thing. Gradually, though, the changing view of the telephone as something that could be tolerated by the wealthy, if not exactly cherished, was reflected in new handset designs for the Edwardian era. A bit like the camera, the early telephone started as a kind of scientific experiment, the sort of thing you might find in the lab at Cambridge University, mahogany and brass and bits of wire and huge dials and details like that. And the big leap, I suppose, was the candlestick, which turned this piece of engineering equipment into something that you'd actually give house room to, a consumer object, you might say. The stylish design of the candlestick encouraged the domestic use of telephones but they would only be seen in the wealthiest of homes. If the rest of society wanted to get their hands on a telephone, they were going to have to work for it. Literally. At the heart of the telephone network were the exchanges. They were run by switchboard operators who helped keep the system going for nearly a century. At first, the phone companies used young messenger boys to connect the calls, but it soon became apparent that this was a bad idea. Very quickly the boys were dispensed with because they seemed to be too rude and cheeky to, to customers. Instead, phone companies started recruiting women en masse. This change is actually creating respectable jobs for lower middle class girls. Um, so women are joining the workforce as exchange operators, telephone operators. It's a respectable job for a woman. And that is not an inconsiderable factor in the changing way we were organizing society at this time. 
There's a really simple reason why women were operators. It's because they were cheaper uh, workers than the men. So there were also um, preferences for the sort of cultured, civilized, um, uh, soothing tones of uh, the hello girl, the female telephone operator. The phone companies had very particular requirements. The phone companies were looking for telephone operators who would be able to answer in a particular manner. They were looking for educated, well-spoken young ladies who would be able to enunciate clearly and say, number please, uh, when, you, when you called up. So they had this imagined middle-class style worker, although in fact, lots of varieties of women went into that profession. Women would be recruited as operators for decades to come. They obviously took notice of your speaking voice because you needed to speak clearly. A light would come on in front of the operator. We would put a plug into that hole next to your light and say, number please. Number please, thank you. If you had an experienced telephonist sit with you for a week or so, and they very rarely said number please. It was always rubber knees. <laughs> Go ahead, please. If you wanted to go to the toilet, you had to put your hand up and ask the assistant supervisor, can I have an urgent or a run through? And you weren't allowed off that board until there was a vacancy for you to go. There was one funny call, which I only remembered the other day. I walked back into the switch room from a break, and one of the operators said, you'll never guess what I've just had to look for. She said, I spent hours looking for the Countess of Air. <laughs> Countess of Air, I've looked everywhere. Do you think I could find it? And eventually, in desperation, you would ask them to spell it. It turned out to be the County Surveyor. <laughs> she had a bit of a plum, this lady. <laughs> For the first few decades of its existence, the telephone was the exclusive preserve of businesses and wealthy households. But places began to spring up where anybody could use one. Early phone boxes, known as public call offices or silence cabinets. Some of them were, believed or not, attendant operated. So they would be manned. The attendant would open the call box for you to go in. They would make the call connection for you. They would take your payment and then they would close the door behind you whilst you made your telephone call. Others had coin boxes on them, which actually required you to put 2p or 3p into the box before you made your call. Believe it or not, when you walked into a silent cabinet, the floor moved and the roof lifted, so it was ventilated. Bear in mind, we're talking about a time when people's personal hygiene wasn't as good as it is today, and therefore people would spit into the microphone and those sorts of things. It wasn't long before a love-hate relationship with phone boxes began to develop. So one of the earliest reports of kiosk vandalism, phone box vandalism, was Samuel Wartsky in, in 1907, who got really annoyed because he'd gone into a call box, inserted the money. The operator claimed that they hadn't heard him insert this money. He knew he had, so he got absolutely riled by this and set about wrecking the phone box apparatus and they say each cost uh, 19 shillings worth of damage to the phone box but strangely when he was brought to court the magistrate uh, obviously took pity on him and only fined him one shilling and there we are vandalism begins in 1912 the private phone networks were all taken over by the General Post Office, which was the branch of government in charge of communications. This effectively nationalised the whole system. Phone boxes came in a multitude of shapes and sizes, but the GPO wanted to spread telephones as widely as they could. So in 1920, they tried to come up with a standard design that could be rolled out across the whole country. But they were soon to learn how hard it was to please the public. They introduced, in 1921, the first design, which they called the K1. K1, first of all, is reinforced concrete. It has a door with windows in it. On that, it would say public telephone. It would also say, always open. 
try as they might, the GPO couldn't please everyone with the K1. In Eastbourne, the council wanted a phone box to fit in with the bowling club pavilion. So the GPO gave it a thatched roof. But the K1 just wasn't doing the trick. So in 1924, the GPO tried again. This time they got it right. Nearly. A new competition was held to design, yet again, a standard kiosk. The winner of that was Sir Giles Gilbert Scott, who produced what became Britain's second standard design, the K2. And it was radically different to anything which had gone before. As an architect, he saw this kiosk, this phone box, as a miniature building. It has a lovely domed roof, uh, which they say he took inspiration from the Soane Memorial in St Pancras Old Churchyard in London. It's a cast iron construction, so you've got moulded columns, uh, architectural features. Uh, you have a telephone sign, uh, opaque glass, back illuminated at the top. It looked imposing, but the K2 was too expensive to be installed anywhere outside the capital. So to celebrate the King's Silver Jubilee in 1935, the GPO had one more try. The, the General Post Office once again turned to Sir Charles Gilbert Scott, and what he produced has really become Britain's ubiquitous red phone box, the K6. The K6 had the stylish features of the K2, but it was smaller and cheaper to make. It is well proportioned, the domed roof from the Soane Memorial is preserved. But there was one thing about this new phone box that many people really didn't like. That shocking, un-British red colour. Countryside campaigners demanded a rural version, initially insisting on a colour that was much more appropriate to this green and pleasant land. Grey. And then there was Hull. Kingston-upon-Hull was the only municipality that remained independent from the GPO's telephone network, and it had its own ideas about colour schemes. If you are from Hull, then your, your identity as a person from Hull is slightly bound up with the telephone system. The cream phone box is, is really the icon of the city and you will still see them everywhere. You can buy little biscuit tins in the shape of a, of a cream foam box. If you see the cream foam box, you know that you're home. It's extraordinary how versatile the K6 turned out to be. In rural communities, the red foam box on the edge of the village was the place which kept the place going. People actually would go out and use it to communicate. In cities, it fitted in all kinds of sensitive architectural environments. They were great. They belonged to an era when we still believed in privacy. I'm so sorry to keep you waiting. Not at all. The smartphone um, might put you in constant contact, but it also means everyone knows where you are. If you're a spy or planning a bit of adultery, forget it with a mobile phone. K6 is much better bet. The post office had reached a crossroads by the 1930s. The business world had felt the benefit of telephones, but only the wealthiest actually had one in their home. Calls were just frankly too expensive, and there wasn't enough of an appetite in Britain to pay those high tariffs. So the post office had two tasks. They had to increase the numbers of people using the service, and the way to do that was to reduce those costs. But by increasing the number of people who were using telephones, they could also release more money into developing um, better equipment for the public. So the GPO turned their attention to the aspiring middle classes. Despite the Great Depression, their living standards were on the rise. But it was going to take an enormous effort to convince them to get hooked up. The first step was to make the telephone itself an object of desire. The real change came with the introduction of the new plastics in the 1920s because that meant you could make a one-piece moulded body. The all-in-one pyramid phone is something that you can actually relate to. It's the start of it as an object rather than something which is fitting into its setting. You could see its time. It was actually that moment in Art Deco was giving way to modernity. And so the new look of the phone was something which actually did 
hint at this modern world. But these new phones had more than just panache. They also had a dial. This meant you could make local calls by yourself without the need to go through an operator. Automatic exchanges allowed the GPO to massively increase the number of people on the network. But they didn't come cheap. The government uh, through the post office have invested hugely in the, uh, in the telephone network. At one point in the, in the late 20s they were opening a new automated telephone exchange once a week. Instead of thousands of operators, row after row of electro-mechanical switches connected the calls. The system was invented in the 1890s by an undertaker from Kansas called Allman B. Strouger. When his business went through a lean period, Strouger discovered that the local telephone operator was the wife of his rival, who put anyone phoning up for an undertaker through to her husband. Heaved in the extreme, Strouger set about making a machine that replaced operators entirely. He gets very worried that the women in, in the patch exchange, right, have power. So somebody rings up and says, I want to talk to an undertaker. And come to think of it, it's exactly the argument about Facebook and Google and what comes up if you punch something in. So, he's, so this guy was saying, I am losing business. Here's how it worked. When you selected a number, an electrical contact would generate a series of impulses as you let go of the dial. So the number nine gave out nine impulses, the number three gave out three. These went to the exchange, where the impulses drove a series of selector switches, one for each number you dialed, and they connected you to the right line. Here, on the distribution frame, is the converging point of 10,000 pairs of private telephone lines. The sheer cost of automation meant it took decades to roll out. Manual operators would still be around until the 1970s. But Strouger's machine had other consequences, like creating more jobs for the boys. The telephone exchange is now a, a machine. So a whole new generation of telephone engineers have to be trained on the understanding of the Strouger system. They have to be trained on how to maintain it. So you now find that telephone exchanges have their resident engineering staff who have to look after this machine and care for it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. With new phones, exchanges and an expanding network, the post office was ready to attract new subscribers. But to make the phone as ubiquitous as the letter, the GPO needed to get its message out there. By the end of the 1920s, uh, early 30s, up to 25% of the network was, was not being used. The whole situation changed, really, with the appointment of Clement Attlee as Postmaster General for only a few months in 1931. But he saw immediately that the post office had to change its whole approach. He brought in Stephen Talents, who was a pioneer in, in publicity. He brought in press advertising. He commissioned artists to produce very colourful artwork. A lot of the artwork which they submitted was very imaginative, very leading edge, very modernist, almost Bauhaus. He also worked with young filmmakers and established the GPO film unit. So it was a big push to really change the look of the post office to attract new subscribers. Do not abandon a call without allowing a reasonable time for a distant subscriber to answer. The GPO had begun its campaigns at a time when the competition for middle-class cash was heating up. The radio was becoming popular, cars were cheaper than ever before. The telephone needed to boost its credentials as an essential service for everyday life, particularly in an emergency. A tragic house fire in 1935 led to criticism that the phone system performed poorly in a crisis. What was needed was a dedicated number, a shortcut to the emergency services. What shall I do? Oh! Dial 9999. Higher! Thank you. 
But the question arose, what number to give it? It couldn't be a one because the post office technicians, the engineers, were concerned that there's more chance of a misdial or the equipment not working correctly if the first digit dialed is a one. They wanted another distinctive number and it was decided it would be nine, but then nine, nine, nine. Why not nine, one, one? I don't think anybody knows. But it was the phone as a source of instant information that really impressed the public. In 1936, the GPO again showcased its technical prowess and eye for publicity to launch the most famous service of all, the speaking clock. At the third stroke, it will be 8.57, precisely. The speaking clock was designed by E. Spate at the Post Office Research Station in Dollis Hill, which was in northwest London. And he brought a new way of recording sound to disc, and it was recording the voice onto glass plates, which were then synchronised and when a phone call was made, um, it intercepted that signal and told the time. In order to promote the service, they had a competition called The Girl with the Golden Voice. But there was a slight problem. The winner's voice made it hard to distinguish between certain numbers. At the third stroke, it will be 4.33 and 40 seconds. It was won by a London telephonist, Ethel Kane and she became Jane Kane and uh, took up a film contract. It has to be said that when the engineer who made the recordings, Eugene Wender, who designed the optical disc system that the clock was using, heard the voice and said, well, this is unsatisfactory, can we have the runner-up? And they said, no, you can't, because there's been so much publicity about Jane Kane that you're stuck with her. And she had a slight speech defect, which the judges hadn't noticed. Oh, I'm thrilled, absolutely thrilled to have won this competition. So if you want to know the time, there's no need now to ask a policeman. Just give me a ring sometime. And Wenda had to spend a lot of time working on those optical soundtracks with Indian ink, just changing the shape of the soundtracks to get rid of this speech defect. And there still were complaints for years afterwards that you couldn't distinguish between 30 and 40. The British attitude to telephones was being transformed. More and more people wanted to join the network and the GPO encouraged them. But the failure to deliver on their promises would haunt the service for a generation. With the outbreak of World War II, the drive to get the masses connected came to a sudden grinding halt. The telephone network was redirected away from civilian use to serve military needs. After a decade of being constantly encouraged to make calls, the public was now told to get off the line as quickly as possible. The 1930s advertising was so successful that the network is at capacity and the network was needed for the war effort. The, the post office introduced a whole range of posters with messages like be brief, telephone less, telegraph less, don't phone if a letter will do, because the network was needed for military purposes. The demand for new lines was relentless. There were so many new installations to put in all the arms of the services, all the new airfields, all needed to have their telephone systems and also other landline communication networks for radio systems and the post office did all of those. Keeping the network going was a major concern. Telephone operators found themselves at the spearhead of the GPO's war on the home front. Gene Toms began working as an operator in 1940. When the air raid went, we just put on our tin hats. It was as simple as that, which were, looking back on it, pretty useless. Because it wasn't the bombing that bothered most of us, because if the bomb dropped, I mean, then that was it. It was the shrapnel coming from our own guns, then falling on the tin hats. 
wouldn't have had any impression at all. They would have gone straight through, but it made you feel better. Even getting to work could be a challenge. I turned the corners to go to work, and there was a, a landmine up in the tree outside the building. The Germans used to drop these things by parachute, and they were exactly like the mines that you see at sea. So there was no work that day. There was poor, poor police officers standing there waiting for the bomb disposal squad to arrive. Jean was moved from a local system to the central London Faraday Exchange, one of the largest in the country. It was quite quiet. You could hear um, a hum, but never any real noise. Not unless the air raid siren went, and then, of course, she, everybody ran to put out tin hats on, which was really comical, trying to have a tin hat on with these things stuck to your ear. <laughs> with the German bombing campaign in full flow, operators had to keep calm and carry on. We didn't go anywhere. People still wanted telephone calls, and of course in Faraday, they were all long distance calls, of course, that's why we were there. And some of the, the calls were very urgent. We had the Air Ministry, War Office, Admiralty, all their switchboards came through to us. Sometimes we couldn't get a call through. If we'd had a bad raid on London, we had no lines out. We had to find those that we got, and I have actually called to Glasgow via Cornwall and then to Wales because they were the only ones that had lines. But in wartime, with many calls urgent in one way or another, determining who should be put through first wasn't easy. I must get through straight away. The people who were entitled to priorities one and two were no problem at all. It was those who thought that they were very important who, with a bit of luck, would have priority three. And I'll call him Major Smith, which wasn't his name, and he was a terror. You had to be extremely polite, of course, but tell them that he wasn't, it, that wasn't his job. You're holding up vital war work. But Major Smith, he was definitely my nemesis. <laughs> Not all calls from army personnel were about operational matters. Ordinary soldiers often wanted to speak to loved ones from phone boxes. That was the thing I disliked most, cutting a serviceman off after three minutes. He was talking to his wife or his children or whatever. That, that was the worst bit. Occasionally you would risk and letting them stay. Fortunately, I never got caught. In the exchange, news about the progress of the war travelled fast. I was on duty the morning of DE Day. The rumour rang through the exchange, they've landed and no, they haven't. And I don't know who found out, and by the time they'd actually landed, we knew they were on the way. With the end of the war, thousands returned to civilian life, but it wouldn't be business as usual. Austerity meant long waiting lists, and Britain's telephone infrastructure had taken a battering. A new generation of roaming engineers took on the task of getting the post-war network into shape, rebuilding, repairing and expanding it. This was an enormous challenge, but despite limited resources, they would embrace it. Well, you had a stepped, what was known as a stepped trench. And you shred your pole down to the bottom, pushed it up with a ladder, and then filled it in, and then you climbed the pole. You've got the arms, wooden arms, and you put the insulators and everything on before it went up. So all you had to do was to climb up and put the wires on the insulators. Initially, it was a bit uh, daunting to go up a pole. It used to have leather belts. Once a week, you used to have to coat them with a, a special kind of polish to keep them flexible. And you all had your own belt. You were responsible for your own belt. You got up the pole, holding one hand on the step, and you flicked the belt. And if you got used to it, it would come right round the pole, right to your safety device. You buckled up and then put it into the safety buckle, and bingo, you were there. And I think the worst thing was leaning out. That was the time, and your feet are on two stands. That's the time that, you know, well, do you hold on or what? Once you got used to it, it was all right. Attitudes to safety were rather laissez-faire. Health and safety didn't really exist. I can remember being on one pole, and it was known as a D-pole, it had a red label. 
same danger. <coughs> and we had to transfer the wires off it, and the only thing that was holding it up were the wires. So when I got rid of the last pair, the pole began to go like this, you see. And I thought, oh dear, I'm going down. So I had to unlock my safety belt, jump onto the new pole that was alongside, and the old one just went down. So I thought, that's one off. <laughs> In the 50s and 60s, the sheer scale of the network meant that modernising it was a perpetual struggle. Much of the equipment in the exchanges was ageing and needed teams of engineers to keep it all going. Even in London there was quite a few exchanges that dated from, that, from the 1930s, still working well virtually to the end of the Stroud system until about 1990s. There was a lot of routine work which meant taking switches out, lubricating, cleaning, adjusting. So at each telephone exchange you would find a, a team of engineers whose job it was to actually maintain, that meant cleaning the Strouger equipment, the switch banks and, and keeping it in tip-top condition. And there was also the fault-finding aspect of it. If things obviously went wrong, bits dropped off. You could find yourself being involved on a, on a fault for several days. Parts of the network truly did belong to another era. We were converting telephone exchange to automatic because all around this particular area was manual. And when we'd done Eastern and Oxshot, it was, it was like going back in a time warp. He's in a hurry, Joe. So are we, we've got to have this back in service by morning. And we had to do everything from scratch, rewire every house, bring it up to date, and the Oxshot Telephone Exchange was all in one room. The frame, the equipment, the lot. And at night time, it was manned by a husband and wife team who lived upstairs. Now, it was a very, very personal service because the people used to say, um, I'm, I'm going out, I'll be back about 10 o'clock tonight. So people ring, ringing in, they used to put what called a peg in the multiple, the little note, and they used to take notes just like an answer service, but it's very, very personal, you see. And they're coming and say, did anyone leave any here and call me? Yes, yes, Mr. Sanzo called me, Mr. thank you very much. And at Christmas time, you could not move in that exchange for hampers sent in by the customers. Three for one. It wasn't just the technology that could be tricky, but the customers too. When I was told that uh, a customer was possibly very obnoxious and been shouting and all the rest of it. I would ring and knock on the door in a bright manner and turn my back on the door. And the moment I heard the latch go and the door open, I would swing round with a bright smile on my face and say, uh, good morning, telephone engineer. And uh, of course they, they go to say, uh, think, well, I can't be rude to this fellow. <laughs> he is being pleasant. Hello, 60957. Good morning, the exchange here, just testing the line. Have the engineers left your directory in a dial code list? Thank you. I worked in houses where, you know, the butler came to the door and I said, or oh, GPO, he said, tradesman to the rear. I said, does the doctor go to the rear? He said, no. I said, I'm a doctor of telephones. You see, in I go. And I actually had tea. The tea was pushed on a trolley in and sit down, you know, this. It was that type of area. The limited resources available to expand the phone network presented a conundrum. People wanted to get connected, but there just wasn't the capacity to give everyone a phone. One cheaper solution was to double up with another household, the so-called party line. It was a lot less fun than it sounded. Here's the tea. Thank you very much, lady. We had a party line for a while, which was something that you did. You got it on a slightly different rate. It was cheaper, and you shared the line with somebody else. So you had to kind of gingerly pick it up just to check if there was if the, the people, whoever they were, I mean, they weren't the people, that was the mysterious thing. They weren't the, were they the people next door? I don't know. They almost seemed like occupants of another realm. Oh, um, good morning. Morning. You are Mr. Hilt, aren't you, number 14? Yeah, that's right. 
How do you do? My name's Richards. Oh, how do you do? Pleased to meet you. Mm. I believe we're uh, yes. sort of sharing a line now. Uh, sharing, yes, yes. You would pick up the phone and find that you were connected to somebody else's house. And it meant that the person who you shared the line with, whoever they were talking to, hadn't put the phone down. And I can remember doing things like, you know, when, the, when, when it was stuck in this position, as it were, yelling down the phone to try and attract the attention of a person who, you know, we had no idea who, were, who, who they were, where they were in the world. But you would ring and sh you would shout down the phone in the hope that they would um, hear it and put the phone down so the, the line would be restored and you could actually use it yourself. Of course, not everyone wanted to share. A lady, and she refused to go to the party line. She utterly refused. We couldn't get past the front door. And it was on my patch. Went to see her. I said, look, you, you've got to go. But I can't, she said. It's, it will ruin my business. So I said, how's it going party line ruining your business? Well, she was a lady of the night. <laughs> so she didn't want to go party line. In case the neighbour picked up and could hear the customers applying for a time and place. Eventually we did get in and converted a party line. But uh, we never said nothing to the other half that what she was doing, obviously, because he'd, he'd be listening on the phone all the time. The party line enabled more subscribers to get on the network, even if some were unimpressed. But behind the scenes, the GPO were making advances in technology that would change how people used their phones. In 1958, the Queen visited Bristol to unveil a new system with the slightly unfortunate name of STD, subscriber trunk dialing. STD meant you could make long distance calls without the help of an operator, and they cost less. The Lord Provost of Edinburgh speaking. This is the Queen speaking from Bristol. Good afternoon, Lord Provost. STD also made phone calls more complicated. It inevitably made telephone numbers got larger because you had more numbers that uh, had to be used to represent the whole country rather than just a small region. So we get regional codes. Uh, this is when Manchester becomes 061, it's when London becomes 01 and so on. What is your number, please? Well, although you're charming, but no more of that. It took a while for the nation to catch up. And this is subscribers' trunk dialing. You, as a subscriber, is dialing your number through the trunk network. And they used to come and, oh, I can see what we're doing. Let us look up the code for Bristol in the code list. Bristol. Here it is, OBR2. O. B. R. 2. I picked up a coin box one day and I said to this gentleman, you can now dial these calls yourself and gave him the code and he said to me, ah, oh, miss, I would try and dial it myself, but there's three letters and only one finger roll. And so I don't know what to do. So then I dialed it for him. When you talk about the introduction of subscriber trunk dialing, you're talking about the continued automation of the telephone network. So inevitably, more engineers are needed because of course the network has got more complicated, uh, there's more technology in the network. It would take a long time before everyone had access to STD. Meanwhile, the GPO once more turned its attention to getting as many people connected as it possibly could. A new post-austerity era was dawning. Oh, two penny worth all I can afford. See you Friday. Bye. Bye on time. Wish I were coming. There you are, Stephen. In the 60s, having a telephone was about living the dream in a very modern way. Everything from music to design demanded the fresh and new. Just as in the 1930s, phones needed to rediscover their sense of style and appeal to a new generation of potential callers. The telephone age. Yes, indeed it is. The telephone is everywhere around us, part of our lives, as modern as the jet plane.
as familiar and as taken for granted as an electric cooker. We were going in the 60s from a period of austerity, of post-war rationing, to a time of consumer abundance. And that spilled over into everything, the color of the phone, its shape, the idea that you might actually change it um, regularly, that you had some kind of choice, that you weren't just being provided. Just here, there on the full table. The introduction of modern plastics into the telephone also brought with it color. And now you had a choice of color for the phone. It didn't have to be black anymore. And I had one lady one day, she said, that, now I'll arrange the hall table and with the phone on it, don't fix it yet. And she opened the front door and she walked down the path to the front gate and she said, oh yes, yes, that's what I do. And what she was looking for was that when the front door was open, the neighbors would be able to see the colored phone through the front door. <laughs> If you wanted cream, you could have cream. If you wanted red, you could have red. The phone is becoming fashionable. It's tuning in to that interest in, in home decoration. There's some more over here, you know. The coolest phone of the lot was the trim phone. Mrs Lund takes it all in her stride, and she decides that a blue trim phone will match the new decorations in the hall very nicely, thank you. The General Post Office actually wanted a more luxurious phone, a, a, a different style of phone. And that brought along really quite a novel design, the so-called trim phone. Trim ringer illuminated model trim phone. And this was quite different to any of the other uh, handsets of the time. First of all, the actual handset you held was L-shaped. It sat vertically on the body of the phone rather than horizontally at the top. It was also as it turned out later in life, controversial, uh, had an illuminated dial. It glowed in the dark, uh, and the controversy was over how that glow was done, which was a small amount of radioactivity in a glass tube uh, underneath the dial. Changing the shape, the form, the shape of the handle, the trim phone was trying to be a revolution. You could say maybe it was the Mini Cooper of uh, telephone design. It looked lighter, it was less ponderous, it sort of belonged to this modern, drip-dry, nylon world. Satisfied that everything's working correctly, it's over to you, Mrs. Lund, and that's all there is to it. It's off to the next job for him, and for her, a chance to try the new phone for herself, and guess who she calls first? Why, Mr. Lund, of course. She tells him she's speaking from their very own phone. Well, isn't that nice? With new colours and shapes available, phones were more appealing than ever before, and more people wanted one. In 1965, the post office had 4.3 million subscribers, many of whom had bought into the aspirational lifestyle that the new telephones represented. But the reality of the service was often considerably less inspiring. We'd just pick up the phone and there'd be nothing happening, and, and you could sort of hear clicks and things and know that someone was there and they wouldn't speak to you. I have to wait sometimes 15 to 20 minutes before I can get hold of the operator to make a call. I find that quite often my calls don't ring straight through and you have to try at least four or five times before the call actually registers. So Edward Byrne, as Postmaster General, why is it, do you think, that the Post Office Telephone Service has got such a bad name? Well, first of all, I don't think it has. I mean, we commission independent surveys and 70% um, are satisfied, it's not good enough. But uh, the people appearing in the programme were not representative, of course. Obviously, they were picked because they had complaints. Well, we are investigating complaints, I and mean, this is the purpose Well, of I appreciate this, but I, I mean, any viewer looking at it would, would want to know that this isn't, of course, a, a cross-section. I can't hear you. Even a well-known mayor waded into the debate. What? Yes, crackling. No, it's no good. Try again later. I've had the same trouble, says Mr. Troop. Every time I ring anybody up, there's this crackling noise and I can't hear a thing. There is an episode of Trumpton where the phone system goes totally haywire, really, and it creates, it creates chaos in the town. Nobody's calls are connected properly because this character, he's just some guy from the GP. Actually, he's not even from the GPO, he's from the PO, which perhaps tells us uh, something about uh, uh, Trumpton's attitude to the telecommunications system. Engineers. And he makes all these connections um, in the wrong way, and all of these cross-purposes 
um, conversations happen, including a, 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 a false call for the for the emergency services of Trumpton. And we know how, how hard-pressed they are because they're called out every week to deal with something. During the 60s, phone subscriptions doubled. But for most of the country, making a call still meant using a phone box. And the service could be even worse than home phones. But there are 20 times as many complaints about public telephones as about private ones. Complaints about broken instruments, directories missing or torn up, cracked glass and filthy floors. Of course, the post office is well aware of these problems. And in 1962, they designed and launched these brave new kiosks, all glass and aluminium. Three years later, and the total number of these super kiosks throughout the land is five. The GPO needed to dispel the nagging doubts about telephones and reassure the public that the future would be bright. And they did it with a dazzling, unmissable symbol of technological prowess. By the early 60s, the GPO needed to find a new way of meeting the growing demand for connections and get ahead of the game. Simply winding out ever more landlines wasn't going to cut it. Instead, they went wireless, turning to a technology that transmitted microwaves through the air. In 1961, construction began on the post office tower. The tower was actually built essentially as a tall radio antenna. And throughout the country, there was a whole series of these towers built, not quite as elegant as the post office tower in London, but as functional. So this whole network was built in order to provide the capacity for the, the handling of the phone calls we were now making. The tower could handle 150,000 calls simultaneously. The GPO built it so tall that nothing else would get in the way of the signal. It was part of a network of 130 stations throughout the country and the tallest building in London when it was finished. But the tower was more than the sum of its parts. It made you feel that the telephonic future was in good hands. And you could stop by for a bite to eat, if you had the head for it. You're going to have the floor of the restaurant revolving. Uh, Why do you do this? Well, don't you think it'd be rather fun? Don't you think anybody who goes up 500 feet would like a panoramic view of the greatest capital in the world just spread out in front of them? It won't go down too fast, you know, about uh, one revolution in half an hour. So it won't put them off their food? Well, I don't think so. I don't think so. However, there was a downside to this growing technological transformation. Creating a network that could cater for everyone meant removing people from the process. Operators had been at the centre of the system since the outset, but in the 1970s, the last manual exchanges were finally replaced by machines. We were a family. Everybody looked after everybody. We grew up through those teenage years, learning from each other, learning about boys and life. Everything was done together as a real family we all realised that was the end of an era. It was a sad time for operators, but automation and the post office's new technology meant that the infrastructure was finally in place to begin to match demand. During the 70s, having a phone in the home became considered a necessity. The baby boom generation were starting families of their own, and consumer culture had given them very different expectations from their parents. They wanted their mod cons, and they had the disposable income to buy them. Uptake in the 1970s was particularly marked, and that may have been because families were moving around the country. You see higher levels of geographical mobility. So Britons had a stronger need to phone home to try to maintain contact, for example, with the families who were being rehoused outside of London in the overspill developments and who wanted to maintain their links with their prior friends and family. Hello? Hello, Granny. Granny! Your phone could get you closer to someone. Ever more of us were joining the network. 
but even with access to our own phones, we weren't exactly a nation of chatterboxes. Most people kept a wary eye on the length of calls. The public needed convincing to loosen up, relax and stop worrying about the cost. In 1976, the post office came up with just the thing to help us along. A yellow bird called Busby. Hey, listen to this. Busby was the state-owned bird who represented the phone system and who, I think, used to kind of hang around in telephone boxes, um, encouraging people to use them. First, I fell out of the nest this morning and hit me head. <laughs> and I sprained me ankle on the way to the shop. The 1976 Busby campaign really changes the pace, in my view, because suddenly you've got a campaign which has gone truly national. It was truly a massive campaign, probably the largest and first of its type. And that really brought the telephone into the consciousness of the general public. And if you dial direct on your own phone during cheap rate, you get at least three minutes for less than 10p. So why not phone someone you love tonight? It could be the happiest 10p you've ever spent. After a few years of Busby flapping around, the burgeoning network was making millions. By the 1980s, we'd become the nation of phone users that the early pioneers had dreamed of. What had once been a service was now very much a business with what appeared to be a lucrative future. So, in 1984, the government sold it off. But as the shareholders of this newly privatised business dreamed of their coming balance sheets, a quirky piece of new technology arrived on the scene that would go on to change the world. The C5. No, not the C5. Right, now then, I've got my cellular radio phone here. That's it. You see, no cables attached at all, completely portable. Now, of course, we all use mobile phones. But in true telephone tradition, we still complain about bad service and dodgy lines. And sometimes we even use them to speak to people. The popularity of the mobile phone appeared to signal the death of the old landline. But that was before the arrival of something nobody was expecting. The internet. A communications revolution that used the landline network to transmit digital data. All that effort by the pioneers and builders of Britain's phone system was vindicated by a technology they could never have imagined. So, the landline lives on, the epic achievement of a century of struggle to connect the nation. It was part of history, and it was something that I don't really think I would have wanted to have missed. I was very proud of the work I did, and I'm still very proud. I saw a revolution outside. I never thought it would happen, but it did. It was changing every day. Before your eyes, you saw a vast advancement in communications. Mm -hmm.